Hey everybody, welcome back to Chem 104 lecture. We're on chapter 9. That means we've got one more chapter to go, and it's not even the full chapter. So congratulations for getting this far. This chapter is on solutions. We're going to have a lot of concepts, but we're also going to have some math. So if math isn't your strong point, you'll definitely want to get tutoring or come to office hours for help. We're going to be talking about dialysis as one of our links to health. We're going to talk about how dialysis works, but first you need to understand some things about solutions. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures of at least two substances. And they form when there's enough attraction between solute and solvent molecules. And we'll talk about what those are. Solutions have two components, the solvent which is present in a larger amount, and the solute, which is present in a smaller amount. You'll need to know these definitions, so I'm going to highlight them right here. There's the solvent, and you know I like colors by now, and solute. We'll talk about solutes first. Remember, these are the ones that are dissolved in the solvent. There's a smaller amount of this. Solutes can be liquids, gases, or solids. They can be any phase, any state of matter. They're spread evenly throughout the solution. And they mix with the solvents so that the solute and solvent have the same physical state. That's key. I think I like my yellow better. I'll switch back to that. Spread evenly is also very important. They cannot be separated by filtration. But they can be separated by evaporation. If you think about leaving a cup of salt water on the table, or if you've ever gone to the beach, and you collect water everywhere, and then it dries and you see all that white stuff, that's all the salt and everything else that's dissolved in the water in the ocean. So you can't separate solutes out by filtration, but you can separate them by evaporation. Solutes are also not visible, but they can give a color to the solution. This is an example of a solute dissolved in water. Copper 2 sulfate forms a very pretty blue color. So it starts off as a solid, and the crystals start to dissolve and become evenly dispersed among the water. So you go from this very concentrated blue down at the bottom to something that is a very pretty blue throughout. Here are some examples of solutions. There are things that you might not think about as solutions, like air. Air is gas in a gas, right? So air that we breathe is mostly nitrogen gas. All the other things dissolved in it, like oxygen gas, are solutes. There are liquids, so gas in a liquid, like soda water, ammonia, liquids in liquids, solids in liquids. So there's all different types of solutions. And this table gives you some good examples, some that you'll know and some that you might not know. Water is a great solvent. It's one of the most common solvents in nature. We're made of mostly water. It's polar due to the polar OH bonds. And to bring back the chapter six knowledge, because we just said polar OH bonds. Remember these are hydrogen bonds. So water's got two lone pairs that are going to push those two hydrogens, the bonds to the two hydrogens, down a little bit. It's going to have a bent configuration as a molecule. And these hydrogen bonds, they form with a lot of biological compounds. They're really important. 
So that's why water is like amazing, okay? Also remember that with water, these are polar, not ionic bonds. So that means that we have partial positives and partial negatives. There's partial positive charge around the hydrogens, partial negative where the oxygen is. Solutions form when the interactions between the solute and the solvent are large enough to overcome the solute-solute interactions and the solvent-solvent interactions. What does that mean? If I have salt, sodium chloride, then I've got a crystal that has all these sodium ions and chlorine ions. They're very happy interacting with each other. With water, I've got all of these water molecules that are happy interacting with each other. In order for a solution to form, we have to sever the interactions between the solute and the solute and the solvent so that instead we have the ions interacting with the water. That's what has to happen for a solution to form. Solutions will form when the solute and solvent have similar polarities. So you may have heard like dissolves like before. If you have something that is polar, it needs to be dissolved in a polar solvent. If something's nonpolar, it needs a nonpolar solvent. If you try to mix a polar solute with a nonpolar solvent, it's not going to work. The reverse is true as well. If you have a non-polar sol solute and a polar solvent, not going to work. Think about oil and water. Oil, non-polar. Water, polar. They don't like to mix. Solutions that have ionic solutes, they undergo what's called hydration. The water molecules surround each ion and kind of pull it off into solution. So if you start with a solid piece of salt and you add it to water, that's what this is right here, the water that's above or underneath the arrow, that means it's not really a reactant, it's just, you're just adding it, okay? What happens is you form sodium ions and chlorine ions and that AQ means aqueous which equals dissolved in water. This is an example of an equation that you'll need to be able to write to show how something dissolves in water. We'll do more practice of this. Solutions with polar solutes. If you've got a polar molecule like methanol, the only reason it's soluble in water is because it has a polar OH group. So I like to write methanol like this, CH3OH. And the reason is that OH group is a functional group that is polar. And because of that polar group, it can form hydrogen bonds with the water. You're not gonna get any ions forming here. You're just going to have water interacting with that polar part of the molecule. Solutions with nonpolar solutes 
we're still talking about, you know, trying to get something like an oil or grease to dissolve in water, it's not going to happen. There's no attraction. If you have a nonpolar solute, you have to have a nonpolar solvent. So let's do a quick learning check. This is reaching back to the very beginning to talk about solutes and solvents. Identify the solute in each of the following solutions. I recommend that you just pause it here, take two seconds, look at these, and either think about the answers or write it down in your notebook, and then see what the response is. The solute is the smallest part of a solution. In A, we've got two grams of sugar and 100 milliliters of water. Two grams of sugar is pretty small in comparison to 100 milliliters of water. So that's gonna be our solute. 60 milliliters of ethyl alcohol and 30 milliliters of methyl alcohol. The smallest part is 30 milliliters. I don't know why I circled it that way, but I did. So methyl alcohol is going to be the solute. Now we're moving on to talk about electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Electrolytes are really important because they maintain um, homeostasis in our cells and in our organs and you can actually detect certain metabolic diseases just by looking at the levels of different electrolytes in the body. We'll start with strong electrolytes. They completely dissociate in water. They make positive and negative ions and they form solutions that can actually conduct a current. What you see below is an example of a dissociation equation. We talked about this in the previous section, right? Where we have salt dissolving to form sodium ions and chlorine ions. You'll need to be able to write how a strong electrolyte dissociates. And that's exactly what it does. It breaks apart to form, form ions. And we denote that they are dissolved in water with a Q after it. Weak electrolytes dissolve slightly in water. So you'll form a few ions, but it's mostly undissociated. For this equation, the main thing you wanna see here is that there's these reversible arrows. There's an arrow going in each direction, which means that you have your molecule dissolving and also recombining. So you're forming some ions, but you're also reforming your whole molecule. So if you look at the image, one, this weak electrolyte, not enough to hold a current and light a light bulb, okay? Two, we see a lot of whole molecules in here and not a lot of ions. I'll circle the ions. So the ratio of whole molecule to ions, a lot more whole molecules. Then we've got the non-electrolytes. They dissolve in water as molecules. There's no ions. You aren't lighting any kind of light bulb. So there's no electric current. When you write a... Um, when you write an equation to show how this dissolves in water, you're simply saying, okay, we're taking a liquid or a solid. In this case, we have liquid, this is methanol. And when you add water, you just say aqueous. So that's how you show that it's dissolved in water. This table gives you examples of strong and weak electrolytes and non-electrolytes. 
It also summarizes whether or not it can conduct elect electricity, the types of particles that you'll see in solution. So it's a really good summary table that summarizes the, the main points for each type of solute. Let's do a learning check. For these two questions, you have to choose the one that represents how a strong electrolyte dissolves in water. For both of these, you have an option where it's just a solid, right? That doesn't make sense if we're dissolving something in water. So we can rule that out. Now let's stick with number one. We're choosing between B and C. If calcium chloride dissolves, I make a calcium ion, and I also make two chlorine ions, they're chlorides. The reason that I make two is because there's a subscript here. That subscript says that I have two chlorine atoms in this compound. So we have to choose the one that shows that there are two chlorine atoms. This one shows that there are two chlorine atoms. This top one uses uh, Cl2. That's actually a gas when it's Cl2 like that on its own. We actually have two chloride ions, not one chlorine molecule. Now let's look at number two. Another ionic compound. The subscript three here tells us that we have three potassium ions and you should recognize PO4 as one of those polyatomic ions. It's got a charge of three minus. So A is our option here. If you don't recognize these compounds as ionic compounds, if you don't recognize the polyatomic ions and things of that nature, then you may want to revisit chapter six when we did naming and writing chemical formulas. Now we're going to write equations for the formation of a solution for each of these examples. In A, we've got the partial dissociation of a weak electrolyte. And in B, we're dissolving solid sugar and water. Partial dissociation of a weak electrolyte. What that means when you see partial dissociation in weak electrolyte, think the double arrows. So we know that we're going to be forming some ions, but we're also going to be reforming our molecule, the weak electrolyte. we're going to break off one of these hydrogen ions and we're going to form a negative ion that's just the result of whatever is left over, right? We had three hydrogens, we took one away you write the rest that's left over. And now since we have one less hydrogen, we've got a negative charge. Here we're dissolving solid sugar in water. 
Solid sugar should ring a bell as a non-electrolyte. It's not ionic. We didn't say a weak electrolyte. We're not going to be making any ions here. So we're starting here with the solid. We're adding it to water. And we're simply going to say it's now aqueous. And that's it. We'll practice writing these and picking out the right equation for a weak electrolyte versus a non-electrolyte versus a strong electrolyte in class. An equivalent is the measure that we use to talk about the amount of an electrolyte or an ion that produces one mole of electrical charge. And that charge can be positive or negative, doesn't matter. In solution, the charge of positive ions is always balanced out by the charge of the negative ions. So if you think about dissolving salt in water, you're always going to have equal amounts of the sodium ion and the chloride ion. The concentrations of electrolytes in intravenous fluids are expressed in milliequivalents per liter. One equivalent is equal to 1,000 milliequivalents. So remember milli, that is one of our prefixes, our metric prefixes from chapter two. So let's say that we have a solution and it contains 25 milliequivalents per liter of sodium ions and four milliequivalents per liter of potassium ions. If you wanna know the total positive charge, you add those two together and you get 29. Since the positive has to equal the negative charge, the chloride ion, which is negative, has to also have a concentration of 29 milliequivalents per liter. When we talk about milliequivalents in the number of moles, we can talk about how we can write this as a conversion factor. So if I have one equivalent and one mole, then that's one equivalent over one mole. That is a conversion factor. So the charge on the ion tells you the number of equivalents in one mole. Sodium, potassium, lithium, those all have an ionic charge of one plus. So they have one equivalent per mole. Calcium, however, has a charge of two plus. So when it's dissolved in solution, and when we want to do calculations, calcium has two equivalents for every one mole of calcium that's dissolved. The same goes for any of these different um, polyatomic ions here, like acetate. Whatever the charge is on the ion, that's the number of equivalents that you have in one mole of ions. But what do we do with that information? Here's a couple of sample questions that we'll go through together. Laboratory tests for a patient include a blood calcium level of 8.8 .8 milliequivalents per liter. How many moles of calcium are in 0 0.50 liters of blood. And then if chloride is the only ion present, only other ion present, what is its concentration? So we have to tackle A first before we can tackle B.
we have to figure out how many moles of calcium are in half a liter of blood. We're going to go from the number of milli equivalents to the number of equivalents. And then we're going to go from there to the number of moles of calcium. That's our plan. Starting with our volume, we're first going to use the number of milli equivalents per liter to figure out how many milli equivalents we have. So that was given to us in the problem 8.8 .8 milli equivalents for every one liter of blood. Next, we have to convert that to equivalents. There's one equivalent for every 1,000 milli equivalents. And that's just so that we can have equivalents and we can go from equivalents to moles. Remember on the previous slide, we said that the charge on the ion tells you how many equivalents per mole. Calcium has a charge of two plus, so that means that there are two equivalents in one mole. We can use that to write a conversion factor. In every one mole, there are two equivalents. Let's make sure that our units cancel and we end up where we want to be. First, we get to milli equivalents. So we figure out how much is in the sample. Then we convert from milli equivalents to equivalents. Because then we can use our conversion factor that's based on our knowledge of how many equivalents you get per mole of calcium which is what we do last to get to moles. When you calculate this out, you get 0 0.0022 moles of calcium ions. Now, part B. If the chloride ion is the only other ion present, what is its concentration in milliequivalents per liter? We said that the positive, the total positive and total negative charge has to equal each other, right? If that's the case, then the concentration of calcium has to equal the concentration of the chlorine. So the concentration has to be 8.8 .8 milli equivalents per liter. We'll do more practice of this in class, especially the first one, letter A, where we're doing conversions from volume to the number of moles based on the number of equivalents. So here's our first chemistry link to health. I mentioned earlier that there are electrolytes in our bodies, they're in our body fluids. And there are lots of things that can be tested for when your blood is drawn. So this table 9.6 has various ions 
the levels, like the normal levels that you'll see. And also, the different solutions you may see in a hospital setting, where if you require intravenous solution, so an IV, either because you're dehydrated or you have some kind of illness, anything like that, then the different concentrations of those ions are also shown here. So we've talked about solutions, how they're, what they're made of. We talked about electrolytes, non-electrolytes, weak electrolytes. Now we have to talk about solubility because you can't just keep dissolving an unlimited amount of solute into your solvent. At some point, you're going to reach a point where the solution can't handle anymore, can't dissolve any more of your solute. Solubility is the maximum amount of solute that dissolves in a specific amount of solvent. It's temperature sensitive. We'll talk about the link between temperature and solubility a little bit later. Generally speaking, you express solubility as grams of solute in 100 grams of solvent, and that solvent is usually water. In an unsaturated solution, you have less than the maximum amount of solute, so you can keep dissolving more of your solute. So let's say that you had 40 grams of solute for every 100 grams of water. That's your solubility. In an unsaturated solution, you've dissolved less than 40 grams of solute. So maybe you have 30 grams of solute in 100 grams of water. That's just one example. In a saturated solution, you have the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve. And you're also going to have undissolved solute at the bottom of the container. That undissolved stuff at the bottom is going to kind of go through the process of dissolving and then more falls out and recrystallizes. And then that's an equilibrium process. So you have solute added to your solvent. It dissolves. You become saturated. And then as you add more, you've got some dissolving, some falling out of solution, some dissolving, some falling out of solution. If we stuck with our 40 grams of solute in 100 grams of water, a saturated solution in this case would have more than 40 grams of solute dissolve. So maybe you have 50 or 60 added. That's absolutely above 40 grams of solute. So you're going to see some undissolved solute at the bottom of your container, whether it's a beaker or flask or what have you. These are examples of saturated and unsaturated. So unsaturated is here on the left. You can keep adding. At some point, you reach saturation. You have more than the amount of solute that you can add per 100 grams of your solvent. And so you see that there's some stuff on the bottom, okay? Let's do a learning check. At 40 degrees, 
Potassium bromide has a solubility of 80 grams and 100 grams of water. And we have to identify these two solutions as either saturated or unsaturated. If we have an amount of potassium bromide that is less than 80 grams, in 100 grams of water, then that solution is going to be unsaturated. Anything more, we're going to be saturated. So if we add 60 grams of potassium bromide to 100 grams of water, which is letter A, then that means we've got an unsaturated solution. Sixty grams is less than eighty grams, and we're in one hundred grams of water. Now we've got in B two hundred grams of potassium bromide added to two hundred grams of water. Well, we can simplify that down and write it a different way. 100 grams of potassium bromide in 100 grams of water. Here we've definitely got more than 80 grams dissolved per 100 grams of water. So this solution is going to be saturated. In our learning check there was a temperature mentioned. It was at 40 degrees Celsius. That's because solubility absolutely depends on temperature. In general, solids become more soluble as you increase the temperature of the solute, or the solvent, excuse me. So if you have warm water, it's going to dissolve that salt or that sugar, and you can keep on dissolving much more than if it was really cold water from the fridge. But there is a difference with gases. Solubility of gases actually decreases. So as you increase the temperature, gases are going to prefer to not be in solution. They'd rather be hanging out in the air, in the atmosphere. So this graph on the right shows what happens as the temperature of the solution increases. An example of a gas in, let's say, you know, kind of water would be soda. In soda, you've got carbon dioxide gas dissolved in flavored water. And by flavor, you and I both know that means sugar. If you leave that can of soda out, let's say you drank some, and then you just left it on the table, you're like, I'm going to come back for this. You forget. You come back to it maybe a few hours later, like, oh, yeah. It don't taste the same. It's flat. It doesn't make you go, ah, like it, like it did when you first opened it. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It doesn't make you go, ah, because that carbon dioxide is gone. Okay? Your soda warmed up, and that gas said, look, I've got other places to be, like out in the atmosphere. So thank you, flavored water, but I'm going to hang out somewhere else. So there's your explanation for the first learning check question. When we're talking about solubility of gases, you're increasing the amount of gas that's formed that's coming out of solution. So when you heat it up, you're going to have more carbon dioxide, right? If you have a bottle that is closed, 
you didn't open up that can. You, t you took it out of the cooler, put it down on the porch, and then you got distracted. There was a game of spades going on. Somebody put out the slip and slide. You forgot about it. And then all of a sudden you hear a loud pop. That's your soda can. You decrease the solubility of CO2 in the soda, increases the pressure of the CO2 gas on the can until it pops. Second question, why do fish die in water that's too warm? Well, fish still rely on oxygen. They just don't breathe it in the same way that we do. The water runs over their gills, and they can extract the oxygen from the water because oxygen is dissolved in water. Again, you decrease the solubility of oxygen when the temperature of the water increases. So if they don't have any oxygen in the water to breathe, they're going to die. So don't do that to your fish. If you have a little fish in a tank, don't let them get too hot because they need that oxygen. Now we're gonna talk about two concepts, one that we just introduced, solubility, and pressure. Pressure we talked about in chapter eight when we were talking about gases. Henry's law says, the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly related to the pressure of that gas above the liquid. If you've got a higher pressure, then you're gonna have more gas molecules dissolved in the liquid. So, back to our soda example. Soda is really not great for you, by the way. I can't tell you the last time I've actually had soda, but I just remember it. I remember it being like, oh, this is a fun thing to do. But then when I actually think about what it tastes like, I'm like, man, I'm off that. But it's a very relatable example. In that unopened can of soda, you've got carbon dioxide dissolved in there. The pressure above that liquid of carbon dioxide is the highest that it's ever gonna be when you have not opened the can. As soon as you open it, you release some of that CO2. Now you've got a lower pressure of gas above the liquid. So you're going to have a lower amount of gas dissolved in the liquid. So this is the take home here. When the pressure of a gas above a solution decreases, the solubility of that gas in the solution also decreases. Now we need to talk about ionic compounds and solubility for those. Ionic compounds contain soluble cation or anion, and they're soluble in water. We're not talking about other solvents here, just water. With an insoluble ionic compound, the ionic bonds are too strong for the water to break apart. Remember, a solution only forms because the bonds between, you know, the solute-solute interactions are weak enough to where the water can come in and be like, hey, but what about me, though? For an insoluble ionic compound, the water is like, hey, what about me, though? And the compound is like, nah, we all right. I'm straight. I'm good. 
there are solubility rules that can predict whether an ionic compound should dissolve in water or if it's going to just be insoluble. And table 9.7 summarizes these rules. If you have any of these positive ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or ammonia, it's going to be soluble. So we'll use green for go, soluble, and a happy face. There you go. If you have any of the following negative ions, nitrate, acetate, chloride, bromide, iodide, sulfate, we're going to be soluble. But there are some exceptions. If you see silver, lead 2 plus, or mercury 1 with one of the halides, chlorine, bromine, iodine, those are insoluble. Likewise, barium, lead, calcium, strontium, mercury 1 with sulfate, insoluble. So there are some exceptions. If you don't see any of the ions mentioned, the positive or negative, then you should suspect that it's probably insoluble. Here are some examples of insoluble solids. So we've got cadmium sulfide. None of those were mentioned on that table. So if you don't see it at all, then it's probably insoluble. Same thing with iron 2 sulfide. Pretty colors, lovely patterns of things falling out of solution, but again, insoluble. Lead 2 iodide, this is an exception. Normally, things that have the iodide ion are soluble, but lead 2 plus is an exception. Forms a yellow precipitate. And our last example is nickel 2 hydroxide. You don't see anything about nickel or hydroxide on that table. So that means if it's not mentioned, it's probably insoluble. This image on the right shows barium sulfate, which is used to enhance x-rays, which is kind of cool. This table gives some explanations of why certain compounds are soluble or insoluble. It gives you some idea of how to reason using the solubility rules in table 9.7. Let's go through these and explain why or why not in terms of solubility. I recommend that you pause it here and try it yourself. Cadmium sulf sulfide, insoluble. There are no soluble ions present. Sodium sulfate, absolutely soluble. Because both sodium and sulfate are soluble. And anything with sodium is going to be soluble. Lead to iodide, insoluble. It's one of those exceptions with the iodide. Nickel to nitrate, 
soluble. The nitrate ion is soluble. So it's very likely that the whole thing is soluble. We can use these same solubility rules to predict whether a solid called a precipitate forms when you mix two solutions of ionic compounds. So here's a sample question. What precipitate forms when solutions of lead to nitrate and potassium sulfate are mixed? First thing we have to do is write this out as a chemical equation. Their solution, so they're aqueous. When we mix them together, what we're doing is taking our solution of lead 2 plus ions, nitrate ions, potassium ions and sulfate ions. This is what's in that in each of your containers. So this is your first solution one, we'll call it. And solution two. Those are the ions in each of these solutions. When you pour them into the same beaker, you mix them now they have an opportunity to get to know each other, swap partners. So the lead is going to say, hey, sulfate, how are you? I've never met you before. My name is lead. And the potassium is going to be like nitrate. I think I met you this one time at that one place. And what you have to do is use the solubility rules to see if what you make is soluble or insoluble. So if we combine the lead 2 with the sulfate, we would make, let's write it in red, because the arrow is red. We would make lead 2 sulfate. And if we let the potassium and the nitrate mingle, we'd make potassium nitrate. Anything with the potassium, anything with the nitrate, is going to be soluble. So that's definitely aqueous. We have not formed any kind of precipitate there. Sulfates are usually soluble. However, lead 2 plus is an exception. That's going to form a solid. That means lead to sulfate is our precipitate. When you have two solutions and you mix them together, you swap the positive ions and see what you make. If you make something that using the solubility rules you predict to be insoluble, then it forms a solid and that's your precipitate. We'll do more practice of this in class. So far we've talked about what's in a solution. Now we need to talk about how we can make a solution, which means we need to do calculations for concentrations. And we can talk about how reactions happen in solutions and learn how to predict the amount of a product being made. The concentration of a solution can be broken down pretty simply. It's the amount of solute divided by the amount of solution. Solution means the whole thing, okay? So that means solvent and solute. 
the amount of a solute can be expressed in grams. Say you have something solid that you're dissolving like sugar. Or it can be milliliters. Say you're taking a liquid of some kind like vinegar. Well, vinegar is a solution, but if you have acetic acid, glacial acetic acid is what that's called, where there's no water added. Then you can measure that with a volume like milliliters. We could also use moles, which we talked about moles in chapter 7. Moles is kind of the chemist's dozen, right? The same can be said for a solution. You can express it in grams, milliliters, or liters. Can't talk about moles of a solution, though. We're going to dig into some different ways that we can calculate concentrations. The first is the mass percent concentration. This is just the concentration of mass, concentration by mass of solute in the mass of solution. So the mass you have of the solute in grams in the numerator. In the denominator, you've got the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solvent. You take that and you multiply by 100%. It's a mass percent, so you need to see a percent sign somewhere, right? This tells you the grams of solute in 100 grams of solution. And we can use it as a conversion factor. Let's do a practice. Let's say that I have 42 grams of water. And I add that to 8 grams of potassium chloride. The mass percent is going to be 16%. But how? Let's talk about it. You're going to have the mass of your solute, which in this case is the mass of the potassium chloride. That's going to be over top of the mass of the solution which is equal to the mass of the potassium chloride plus the mass of your water. And that's going to be multiplied by 100%. Let's fill in the numbers. We're told that 8 grams of KCl are added to water. The mass of the solution is going to be that 8 grams plus the 42 grams of water. So we have 8 divided by 50 times 100%. And that gives you 16%. Now you may be wondering about the sig figs here. How did we just drop one? When you add these two numbers, they both have digits all the way to the hundredths place. So here we have four sig figs with our 50 three sig figs with 8.00 grams. When you divide, you use the number of sig figs, the, the fewest number of sig figs represented. So we've got three sig figs in our numerator, which means three sig figs in our final answer. Just a little quick reminder about sig figs because they're coming back. Let's try a problem for real, for real. What is the mass percent of sodium hydroxide in a solution prepared by dissolving 30 grams of sodium hydroxide in 120 grams of water? We've got to identify the solute and the solvent. The one that's less is the solute. 
that leaves the water as the solvent. Our equation, mass of the solute over the mass of the solution times 100 percent. We take the 30.0 grams divided by 30.0 grams plus 120.0 grams and multiply by 100 percent. When you do that math, make sure that you do the division first. So you may want to use parentheses around it when you put it into your calculator. In terms of sig figs, we've got three sig figs here and four sig figs here. So we're going to go with three sig figs. That means the solution is 20% mass, the t mass percent is 20% of sodium hydroxide. Let's try another. I told you that the mass percent can be used as a conversion factor. So let's write two conversion factors for an 8.50% mass by mass sodium hydroxide solution. What this means, if we have 8.50 percent what that really means is that I have 8.50 grams of sodium hydroxide and 100 grams Of solution. When we write this out as a fraction, you put 8.50 grams of sodium hydroxide on top and 100 grams of solution on the bottom. As far as sig figs are concerned, if we were using this in a problem, this number here, the top number, 8.50, is measured. So we need to take into account sig figs. And there are three sig figs here. This 100 grams of solution, that's an exact number. It's part of the definition of what a mass by mass percent is. We don't count that when we're looking to figure out how many significant figures we should include in an answer. Now that we've got one of our conversion factors, the other one is easy. It's just the reciprocal. We can use these to solve problems and we will do that in class for sure. Next up, we've got volume percent concentration. You'll see that as V slash V. It's the percent volume in milliliters of a solute to the volume in milliliters of a solution. Very similar to the mass percent. But this time, it's just milliliters. When you're using this as a conversion factor, it's the milliliters of solute for every 100 milliliters of solution. You can also have mass by volume. This is the percent mass in grams of a solute to the volume of the solution. This again can be used as a conversion factor. 
you've got the number of grams of solute for every 100 milliliters of solution. We'll do some practice with these in class. I introduced them, I gave you a sample problem. All of them are pretty much the same in terms of how you work them out, but we'll be sure to do practice in class. So make sure that you come to class when we do um, live you know, practice problems together. Another way that we can describe the concentration is using molarity. Molarity is the number of moles of a solute in one liter of solution. We use a capital M when we're talking about molarity. A one molar solution of sodium chloride has one mole of sodium chloride in one liter of solution. And remember, we can figure out moles and we can also talk about mass using molar mass. So molar mass links mass in grams to moles. We're going to need that when we do some of these molarity problems. What is the molarity of 0 0.500 liters of sodium hydroxide solution if it contains 6 grams of sodium hydroxide? Didn't I tell you we were going to need molar mass? I wasn't lying. The first step for this problem is to calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in 6 grams. For that, we need the molar mass. You go to the periodic table, you find sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen, and you write down what the atomic mass is for each of those. That's sodium, that's oxygen, and that is hydrogen. So our molar mass, we've got one mole of sodium hydroxide is equal to a mass of 40.01 grams. We can write conversion factors using this equality. Then we take our 6 grams and we use the conversion factor that's going to get us from grams to moles. the grams cancel, you're left with moles. In your calculator, you're taking six and dividing it by 40.01.
you should get something in the ballpark of 0 0.150 moles of sodium hydroxide. Our second step is to calculate molarity using the moles of sodium hydroxide and the volume of the solution. I'm going to write that on the side here because I ran myself out of room. Molarity is the number of moles of solvent or solute over the volume of the solvent in liters or the, the whole solution. Let's try that again. Moles of solute divided by liters of solution. There we go, much better. We calculated 0 0.150 moles. The problem tells us we have 0 0.500 liters. When you divide, you get 0 0.300 molar. The steps are always the same when you're calculating molarity when you have the mass of the solute and the volume of the solution. What changes is what the molar mass is, but you always do the same second step where you divide the number of moles by the volume of the solution. We can use molarity as a conversion factor. So if you take molarity, like 3.5 molar HCl, what you can write that as is 1 liter of solution equals 3.5 moles of HCl. And then you can write that as conversion factors. All of these concentrations that we've talked about so far, we can use as conversion factors. And you have to do that in the real world in lab because you need to do calculations to figure out how much of, you know, this solution do I need if I want to have, you know, this much, um, this many moles of this or this many grams of that. So this is a real world thing that you'll use if you do any kind of lab work. This table gives you some examples of conversion factors from percent concentrations, and molarity. Let's try one out. How many grams of sodium hydroxide are needed to prepare 75 grams of a 14% mass percent sodium hydroxide solution? We're preparing 75 grams of a solution. And that's what the concentration needs to be. Well, what does 14% mean? 14% means that I have 14 grams of sodium hydroxide in 100 grams of solution. I can write this as a conversion factor. Then I can write the other conversion factor by just writing the reciprocal. I always like to have my options written out so that I can choose the one that makes the most sense for the problem at hand. 
Now that we've got our conversion factors, we can set up a problem. I want to make 75 grams of solution. I'm trying to figure out how many grams of sodium hydroxide I need. To do this, I need the conversion factor that has grams of solution in the denominator. That way, when I do my math, the units will cancel and leave me with grams of sodium hydroxide. The units cancel, and in your calculator, you'll want to enter 75 times 14 divided by 100. Don't forget to divide by 100, or else your answer will be crazy ridiculous. you should get 10.5 grams of sodium hydroxide. I highly encourage you to try putting these things into your calculator and checking that you can actually get the same answer as me so that you know how to put these problems in no matter what problem you're faced with. When chemical reactions involve aqueous solutions, one, you have to have a balanced chemical equation. We learned how to do that in chapter seven, and we were doing some calculations with those balanced chemical equations too. You also have to have the molarity and the volume. That way we can determine moles or grams of any reactant or product involved. Let's say you have some zinc and you put it into a beaker of hydrochloric acid. You make hydrogen gas and zinc chloride, which is aqueous. How many liters of a 1.50 molar HCl solution completely react with 5.32 grams of zinc? Here's the plan. First, I'm going to highlight my relevant information. I know that I have a mass of zinc, and I'm looking for a volume of HCl solution as my answer. So I like to rephrase the question. 5.32 grams of zinc means what in terms of the number of liters of HCl? Now I know what I'm doing, know where I'm starting, where I'm trying to get to. Now I can form a plan. If I know the grams of zinc, a good place to start would be getting to moles. Always convert to moles because that way you have a gateway to figure out how much of another reactant or product you make or use and you can use a mole ratio to do that. But we can't do anything like that if we don't have moles. You need the molar mass of zinc for that which you can just get from the periodic table. You just look at what the atomic mass is and write that down. Once we have the moles of zinc, we can use our balanced chemical equation to figure out the number of moles of hydrochloric acid.
we need a mole mole factor here. The last step is to get to the number of liters of HCl. We need the molarity of the solution that we're using to get there. Let's fill in the numbers. Starting with our grams, we need to convert to moles. Then we need a mole mole factor. The two compounds we're interested in are the zinc and the HCl. We're trying to get to moles of HCl, so we look at how many moles of HCl are represented in the chemical equation, and there are two. For every two moles of HCl, we react with one mole of zinc. That's our mole-mole factor. Finally, we're going to use the molarity as a conversion factor. We'll have the number of moles of HCl, but we need the number of liters of our 1.5 molar solution. Well, if I have 1.5 molar solution, that means that in one liter of solution, I have 1.50 moles of HCl. To put this into your calculator, you're going to take 5.32 divided by 65.38. I would recommend using parentheses here multiplied by 2 and divided by 1.5. I'll show you that all of these units cancel. You don't have to just take my word for it. We can cancel the grams and we get moles of zinc. Cancel the moles of zinc and you get moles of HCl cancel the moles of HCl, you get liters. And that's our answer, 0 0.108 liters. Now watch these problems because the problem could ask for how many milliliters, in which case we would have to add on another conversion factor to take the liters and convert to milliliters. So just an FYI. This is a concept map for chemical equations because we've talked a lot about how we can do calculations with chemical equations. You can use the mass, the volume of a gas, or the volume of a solution. And this concept map shows you how to get from point A to point B for all of those things. We talked about how to make a solution and how we can um, calculate the concentration of a solution. Oftentimes in a laboratory setting, you're going to want to dilute your solution. It's easy to make a super concentrated stock and then you can take that stock and dilute it down to what you need at a later date. In dilutions, a solvent, usually water, is added to the solution. You're increasing the volume decreasing the concentration. Now if you've ever had orange juice from concentrate, that's an example of a dilution. You pour the, you know, the can out into a pitcher and then you add however many cans of water it says to add. You stir it up and there you go, orange juice. I'm not a fan. To me, that is drink. That is orange drink. Not a fan. 
I need the stuff that is cold in the cold area of the grocery store. Not bougie enough to squeeze it by hand. That's a lot of work. But I will buy some Simply Orange and be happy. Don't give me that canned stuff. That drink, mm -mm. that is, it is past tense. That's how I feel about it. I, it is so bad, it is past tense to me. Anyway, we need to talk about dilutions. You add water, volume increases, concentration decreases. The mass of solute in solution remains the same. That last part is important because that's how we can do our calculations. In the initial and the diluted solution, the number of moles of solute are the same. So let's say that I took five milliliters of 10 molar NaCl. And I made a dilution. That dilution will still have the same number of moles as the five milliliters that were used to make it. That's the premise that we're using. So the concentration times the volume of your initial is going to be equal to the concentration times the volume of your diluted solution. So the initial solution is the one that is more concentrated. The diluted solution is your final product. The concentration can be a percent concentration or a molarity. Doesn't matter. This is just showing you what it looks like in terms of making a dilution. Same number of particles, it's just that they're, you know, the concentration isn't as high because you've added water. Let's do a sample calculation. What is the final concentration, let me get my highlighter out, when a 0.5 liter, when 0.5 liters of 6 molar HCl is diluted to a final volume of 1 liter? Just like I did with the gas law problems, for these dilution problems, I like to identify what I have and assign variables. The first set of information, the 0.5 liters of a six molar HCl solution, that's our initial solution. The final volume of one liter, that tells us it has to do with the diluted solution, right? If our equation is C1 V1 equals C2 V2 initial and diluted respectively, then we can assign some variables. C1 is going to be the concentration initially, which is 6.0 molar. V1 is the amount of volume that we're taking and adding water to, 0 0.50 liters. C2, that's what the question is. What is the final concentration? I don't know, but it's going to be something that's in molarity because that's what my initial concentration is in. V2, I'm told it's one liter. I'm solving for C2. I'm going to divide both sides by V2. C2, which is my concentration 
of the diluted solution is equal to the concentration of my first solution, the initial one, times the volume initially divided by my final volume. Now you plug in the numbers. C1, 6 molar. V1, 0 0.50 liters. V2, 1 liter. You do the math. You just multiply 6 times 0 0.5. You don't have to put the divided by 1 because, well, it's just going to be itself. That gives you 3 molar. Remember that the liters cancel out. So this is going to be our unit, molar, molarity. Let's try a different one, only this time we're talking about mass by volume. What is the percent mass by volume of a solution prepared by diluting 10 milliliters of 9% sodium hydroxide to 60 milliliters. So we're taking 10 milliliters, putting it into a flask, and then adding water up to 60. That's what we're doing. Still the same idea, C1, V1 equals C2, V2. Our variables, let's assign those. C1, that's going to be 9%. These are our initial conditions. V1, we've got 10 milliliters. C2, we don't know yet, but it's going to be a percentage because that's what our initial concentration is in. V2, we're told, is 60 milliliters. Same idea as last time. We're solving for the new concentration. Divide by V2 on both sides. Then you substitute in all the numbers that you know. The units for the volume will cancel. And when you're putting this into your calculator, again, parentheses are your friends. You may want to put parentheses around there just to make sure that everything gets done the way you want it to get done. Your answer should be 1.50%. That is the new concentration. Now we're in the home stretch. We've got to talk about properties of solutions. In the image here, you're seeing someone add ethylene glycol to a radiator. That helps so that it will decrease the freezing point so that you can, you know, continue to warm, right? That's what a radiator does. It radiates heat. You need it to do that at lower temperatures. So we talked a lot about solutions. Now we're going to introduce colloids. Solutions are transparent. They don't separate. They have small particles, or ions, or molecules that you can't filter. And those small particles will pass through a semi-permeable membrane. 
That's a new bit of information that we didn't cover when we first started talking about solutions. Colloids, on the other hand, have medium-sized particles. They also cannot be filtered, but they can be separated by semi-permeable membranes. Remember that difference between a solution and a colloid. This table gives examples of colloids that you might not think about. Fog, clouds, those are colloids. Dust, smoke, if you like Ready Whip, the whipped cream in a can, those are colloids. We also have suspensions. Suspensions are heterogeneous and they're non-uniform. Okay? Heterogeneous means that you can see the separate parts of the mixture. They've got very large particles that settle out of solution, so you can filter it. And these must be stirred to stay suspended. Examples of suspensions would be blood platelets. So if you draw a sample of blood and you just let it sit, you'll have the platelets settle down to the bottom. Muddy water, again, you know I have children. They like to play in mud. If they decide to collect mud in any kind of a vessel, the mud will sink down to the bottom and then you'll have water sitting on top of it. And it's very unpleasant when you find it. Calamine lotion. If you've ever been itchy because of poison ivy, poison oak, chicken pox, calamine lotion is used to, um, you know, make it a little bit better. But it's a, it's a suspension. Science. It's great. So this table, 9.12, compares solutions, colloids, and suspensions. It tells you about the types of particles, their size, whether they settle or not, and how you can separate them. This table is great for um, summarizing how these things are similar and how they're different. How they're different is what you should focus on so that you can identify them in a question. This is just an image that brings home that table, the comparison of solutions, colloids, and suspensions. If you're a visual person, then I recommend looking at this particular slide so you can see the difference. But why do we care about these things? We've been talking about solutions and adding a solute to a solvent. What does that do? When you do that, you actually change the properties of the water or whatever the solvent is but we're gonna talk about it in the context of water. The vapor pressure of the solution decreases, boiling point increases, and the freezing point decreases. These properties are called colligative properties. And they only depend on the concentration of the solute particles. Doesn't matter what the identity of the solute particles is. It could be sodium chloride, it could be calcium carbonate, it could be anything. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. We just care about how much. So when you increase the concentration of solute particles in your solution, you're decreasing the number of solvent particles at the surface of the solution. If you decrease the number of particles in the surface, then you're gonna prevent your solvent particles from actually leaving solution. That leads to a lower vapor pressure. You can see this depicted in these two beakers. If you have a pure solvent, say just water, 
then you have all of these wonderful little particles that can free themselves of the surface. However, you add something like salt to the water. Well, now you've got these big old ions here that are getting in the way of the water. So you've got fewer water molecules at the surface and fewer of them can liberate themselves from the surface. That decreases the vapor pressure. When you increase the concentration of non-volatile particle, um, sol solute particles, non-volatile meaning that they're not going to, you know, go wee and be free. They're not going to um, boil off before your sol solvent. When you have non-volatile solute particles, you're going to increase the boiling point of your solution. You're decreasing the vapor pressure so it's going to take you longer to build up your vapor pressure so that you're at the atmospheric pressure. Because remember, when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, that leads to boiling. If, however, you decrease the vapor pressure, it's going to take you longer to build up that atmospheric pressure. So it may take a higher temperature to liberate more of those solvent particles, like your water, to actually get to a boiling point. When you add salt to an icy road, you're doing yourself a favor, okay? What you're doing is you're depressing the freezing point. That means that the ice will no longer be ice at zero degrees Celsius. It means that you have to have a colder temperature in order for the water to freeze. When you add ethylene glycol to water, you're increasing the number of hydrogen bonds that form in solution, and you're lowering that freezing point and raising the boiling point of the solution. So now you've got liquid water at a much bigger range than you normally would if it was pure water alone. If you have a non-electrolyte dissolved, it dissolves as a molecule. We talked about that at the, near the beginning of this chapter nine lecture. If you have a strong electrolyte, you make ions. So we've got an example of each. There's antifreeze, which is ethylene glycol. It is a non-electrolyte. And it dissolves as molecules in water. So if you have one mole of liquid ethylene glycol and you add it to water, you've got one mole of aqueous ethylene glycol. Sodium chloride, however, it's an ionic compound. It's a strong electrolyte. So it's going to dissolve as ions. You have sodium ions and chlorine chloride ions. What that means is when you dissolve one mole of NaCl, you have one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions, which means you've got two moles of particles in solution. And this is going to be key when we look at how the concentration of solute affects freezing point depression. This table shows you the effect of solute concentration on freezing and boiling points of one kilogram of water. We're only going to be dealing with water here. 
if you've got no solute, your freezing point is zero, your boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. If you add a mole of a non-electrolyte, then you now have one mole of solute in one kilogram of water. That changes your freezing point by 1.86. It lowers it by that amount. So for every one mole of solute, you have a change in temperature of 1.86 degrees Celsius. This is for the freezing point. For the boiling point, when you have one mole, you have an increase of 0.51 degrees Celsius. So for every mole of solute, you have a temperature change of 0.51 degrees Celsius. We're going to need this to do some practice calculations to determine new freezing points and new boiling points. So let's try one. In the northeastern U.S., during freezing temperatures, calcium chloride is spread on icy highways to melt the ice. Calculate the freezing point of a solution containing half a mole of calcium chloride in one kilogram of water. So here we go. What's really important here is that we have half a mole of calcium chloride and it's in one kilogram of water. We're looking at a freezing point so we know that for every one mole of particles we're going to have a change in our freezing point of 1.86 degrees Celsius. It's going to decrease by that amount. So when we take our calcium chloride as a solid and we add water, we're going to make some ions. We've got calcium and we're going to have two chloride ions. This should look very familiar to one of the learning checks that we did earlier. Remember, what we care about is the amount of particles. So how many moles of particles do we have? Well, we've got one mole of calcium ions and two moles of chloride ions for a total of three moles of particles. And I'm using particles and solute interchangeably here. To figure out our change in temperature, which we'll call delta T, we have to figure out how many moles of particles we have. So with our reaction here, this is for one mole of calcium chloride, but that's not what we're starting with. We're starting with 0.5 moles. And then we can write a conversion factor from what we just figured out. One mole of calcium chloride equals three moles of particles. and that will get us to the number of moles of particles in half a mole. Then we multiply that by 1.86 for every one mole of particles. 
because that's the temperature change associated with the addition of this calcium chloride. We get to moles of particles, and then we get to degrees Celsius. And that's what we want. We want to know the temperature. To put this into your calculator, you take 0.5, multiply by 3, multiply by 1.86. No parentheses needed here. And you get 2.8 degrees C. That's not our final answer. The actual temperature of the water is equal to the freezing point of water minus our change in temperature. The freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. We calculated a 2.8 degrees Celsius change, so it's negative 2.8 degrees Celsius. That's our new freezing point. It's a very similar idea for boiling, and we'll do an example of that in class together. The final part of this section is on osmosis. With osmosis, you have water, which is a solvent, flowing from a lower concentration to a higher concentration of solute, trying to balance out the amount of water and the amount of solute. The level of the solution with the higher solute concentration is going to rise. Eventually, the concentration of the two will become equal. That's osmosis. During osmosis, you generate what's called osmotic pressure. And that pressure is, I'll highlight it here, it's equal to the pressure that would prevent the flow of additional water into the more concentrated solution. And that's going to increase as the number of dissolved particles in the solution increases. Then there's reverse osmosis. And this is a process that's used to uh, purify water. You can actually purchase um, reverse osmosis systems for your apartment or your home and hook it up yourself. You can literally go to Home Depot and get this stuff. In this process, a pressure that's greater than the osmotic pressure is applied to the solution and that forces it through a purification membrane. Then what happens is the flow of the water is reversed, hence reverse osmosis, because the water flows from lower to higher water concentration. And you're leaving behind all of the other junk that's in the water. And there's a lot of contaminants in water. Don't be fooled. Reverse osmosis is used in desalination plants. So if you are in North Carolina, if you ever go to like Wilmington or anywhere on the coast, chances are there's going to be reverse osmosis in play for any restaurants that you go to. They take all, they separate all that salt from the sea, the ocean water so that you can use it as drinking water. And it requires a ton of energy to do that. But the ocean's pretty big, there's a lot of water, and fresh water is kind of limited. So sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. We can also talk about osmosis in relation to our blood cells. So cell membranes in biological systems are semi-permeable. Osmosis is always happening. 
okay? Remember, in our blood, there's so much stuff. There's lots of different molecules, and that cell membrane has to be selective in what it lets in, and it has to be selective in what it lets out back into the blood. Keep what it wants, let out what it doesn't want. The solutes in the body solutions, like blood and tissue fluids and all that stuff, exert osmotic pressure. So when you get an IV placed, say you're dehydrated or something, or you're getting some kind of a um, procedure done where you need to have an IV placed, all of those solutions are what's called isotonic solutions. They exert the same osmotic pressure as body fluids, such as red blood cells. You don't want your red blood cells taking in a bunch of water or releasing a bunch of water. That would be very bad. So these solutions have 5% mass by volume glucose or 0.90% mass by volume sodium chloride. You'll need to remember those values. So that's an isotonic IV solution, okay? Put it down in your notebook. I'll wait a second. I know it's a video that you can pause, but in my mind, I have to treat it like I'm lecturing a group of people. Otherwise, I'm just boring. I'm just be completely honest. So this is me performing, if you will, you know? Instructing is an art. It is an art form. Let's introduce some more terminology. This is a lot of terms here, so all of the ones that I'm kind of highlighting or pointing out, you'll need to know these. We have isotonic solutions. We also have hypotonic and hypertonic. In an isotonic solution, like we talked about before, where we've got the 5% mass by volume glucose or the 0.9% mass by volume sodium chloride, a red blood cell is gonna be happy. It's gonna have its normal shape. All is good here. But let's say you're in a hypotonic solution. That means that you have concentrations that are lower lower concentration of NaCl or glucose in that IV solution. That would be very bad. And the reason is what's going to happen to that red blood cell is it is going to start taking in more water. It's going to swell. And eventually it's going to burst. The membrane for a red blood cell is semi-permeable, and it's going to try to equal out the concentration of solute on the inside of the cell with the blood on the outside, or whatever solution the red blood cell is in. If there's a lot of water on the outside, then it's going to take in some of that water so that the concentration of the solutes inside the red blood cell decreases eventually it will swell and burst. That process is called hemolysis. If, however, you have a hypertonic solution, you've got a higher concentration of your sodium chloride or glucose. And this is relative to that isotonic solution that we talked about. That's the isotonic solution that we're talking about. Hypertonic means you've got higher than that. In this case, you're going to have your red blood cell releasing a lot of water and it's going to shrink up. When it does that, it can't function right. That's called crenation.
you don't want either of these conditions if you have an IV place. So that's why an isotonic solution is used. Now we're going to go through these slides. It just tells you pretty much the same thing that I told you on the last slide. But if you like to have it all separate and you know you like to print these out, then this will have all of the official definitions and things like that. So hypotonic, lower solute concentration than red blood cells. Water flows into the cell, it swells and bursts. Hypertonic, higher solute concentration. Water leaves, it shrinks. I promised that we would talk about dialysis. So here we are. We have enough information to do so. In dialysis, you've got solvent and small solute particles passing through an artificial membrane. All the large particles are left inside. The waste particles that you're interested in removing from the blood, those are pretty small. So those are going to exit. And you'll just be left with blood that's a little bit cleaner. So dialysis is used as kind of like an artificial kidney. The kidney filters the blood and removes things like urea. If you have a buildup of urea and other waste products, you can get gout. And there are plenty of other um, metabolic issues that are caused by having uh, an imbalance of electrolytes and waste products in the blood. You can change the pH of your blood, which is also really bad. And we'll be talking about pH in Chapter 11. So stay tuned. Dialysis is really important if you have issues with your kidney, kidney failure. Those waste products being removed and excess water being removed is essential for you to be healthy. Here's a quick learning check to test your knowledge of isotonic, hypotonic, and hyp... Let me try again because I don't remember which one I just said. Sometimes my brain does that. Isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic solutions. There we go. It's a tongue twister trying to say all three of those. Remember that we're doing this comparison to 5% glucose, 0.9% sodium chloride. That is isotonic. If we've got 2% sodium chloride, that is definitely greater than 0.9. That is hypertonic. 1% glucose is less than the 5% that would be isotonic. So it is hypotonic. That's letter B. 0.5% sodium chloride is less than 0.9%. That will again be hypotonic. 5% glucose right on the money, that's isotonic. So again, make sure that you know those percentages. This is the concept map for chapter nine. If you're into maps, you like to see all of the different vocabulary words and how they link together, then here it is for you. Otherwise, feel free to skip it. And that's it for chapter nine. Thanks for watching. Make sure that you tune in for the live lecture for practice problems and all the details regarding assignments and exams. You don't wanna miss that. Be safe.